Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I am honored to have Pradeep Sangha as our guest. Pradeep helps entrepreneurs master themselves so they can master their life. His personal mission is to help men live more fulfilling lives, have passionate relationships, and raise happy families. As an entrepreneur, husband, and father, Pradeep knows exactly how tough it can be to balance a successful business with a happy family. Pradeep is a pioneer in the inner force formula, a system developed using performance psychology, latest neuroscience, and the ancient art of mindfulness to align a man's life, energy, mind, and emotions to create exponential confidence, performance, vitality, wealth, time, options, joy, and fulfillment. That's a whole lot of greatness right there. But Pradeep, thank you for joining us. And uh, can you tell us your story? You know, how, how you got to where you're at? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me on the show. It's a privilege. So thank you. I appreciate that. So I guess, where do I start? I, I, I grew up in a small town in Canada. It's called Kelowna, British Columbia. And I, I literally grew up on an orchard. My parents immigrated here from India. My dad came here with, I think it was $11 in his pocket. And all they knew how to do was really do manual labor. And they started working on an orchard. And, and that's pretty much how I grew up as a child. They would actually put me in an apple bin while they were picking apples because sometimes they didn't have childcare. So I, I grew up in a life of being around nature in a mindful life, which was great from an upbringing perspective. And on the flip side, I also learned the work ethic that comes along with having an orchard and getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going out there and not having summer holidays like typical kids and just working my butt off. And that's just kind of what led me from one thing to another. Yeah, we actually have that in common because I grew up, I guess if you were go straight across the lake, we're probably about 100 miles apart. But I grew up on a farm in a place called Avoca, New York, and uh, we had apples on our, not an orchard, but just apple trees. And I used to love to go pick the apples off the trees when I got off the school bus. But we had potatoes. We raised potatoes on our farm. Oh, potatoes. Wow. So, and we had cows and all that. So I, I know the work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different lifestyle. So my parents being typical Indians at that time, they, and immigrants, they basically said, hey, look, you need to get an education and not have to be challenged like they were challenged without uh, having a proper education, having to do manual labor. So I basically went down the academic path that I, I followed that and I literally kind of fell into the corporate world. Although my parents wanted me to be either a doctor, a dentist, or a lawyer, that was the path that they were pushing me down. And, and something happened in I, third or fourth year university where I was literally just going to school and, and it just didn't feel right. And I literally just switched over to financial management. And it just so happened that one thing led to another and I kind of got caught in the corporate world. I was in the corporate world for 14 years, but I also had this strong passion to help people. So ever since I was a, a kid at 17, I was a personal trainer, helping people really change their life from a physical perspective. I was always a tutor going through a university and, and not charging, but just doing it because I enjoyed helping other individuals. And at the point of my career, before I started my own business, where I was not happy and I was a very successful executive, I, you could say I kind of had it all. I had the status, I had uh, you know, the income, I had a great path in terms of where I was headed. I kind of had it all, except for the happiness. I didn't have the relationship I wanted with my wife either because I think inside I just wasn't fulfilled. And that was reflecting in who I was as well as my relationship. And so my wife and I were on the verge of, I would say, a divorce at that time. We had a young child and I knew I had to do something completely different because I wasn't feeling authentic. I wasn't feeling like I was living a life that I was meant to live. And I walked into work one day and I just literally quit. And everybody, and I, I remember the reaction that people had and they just said, Pradeep, are you crazy? Are you like, is, is something happening? You know, did, are you having a challenge in your life in some way, shape or form? And they were questioning my sanity. <laughs> it was very, it was very, it was a very interesting time, but I literally just walked away from there. And it's probably the best thing I ever did, obviously, uh, from a life perspective, because it, it led me to where I am now. But I've, I've had some journeys within journeys, let's just say. 
most recently, what has led me to the path I'm on right now is helping men in particular. So I do have female clients as well, but I mainly focus on men just because I kind of fell into that path and realized that there's not very much support out there for men. And men are challenged just like women are when it comes to their levels of self-confidence, their levels of not feeling like they're enough, their challenges in their relationship. And now there's an added pressure on men when it comes to the challenge of this whole concept of masculinity being toxic. And so men are being challenged now in terms of having that masculine side in a way that I think it's unprecedented. And so I'm all for equality and equity when it comes to women. I think that's absolutely necessary. I think women are doing a great thing. On the flip side, what is happening, it's also challenging men to actually be men. And so that is my mission right now is to really help men align themselves and actually create a fulfilling life. Because if you have a strong man and a strong woman in a household and the relationship is solid, they raise healthier children and therefore society is healthier as well. And I think what we're seeing today in a lot of aspects of life, whether it's in the corporate environment or in the political environment, we're just seeing a lot of, I would say, a lack of leadership and a lack of real men. And so my mission right now, and you could call it the mindful crusade, is really to get men back to the level where we need to be. And that is strong, being protective, being mindful of what's really important in life. And so uh, it's kind of led me to where I am. And last year, I actually just lost my father. My father passed away suddenly from a heart attack. And it was meant to be. His time had come. It was just the turn of events that everything happened. Usually at that time of year, he is with me because they live across the country. And for the first time in 10 years, he wasn't out here and he had passed away and he was alone. He's working on the orchard by himself. My mom wasn't around. It just the circumstances just all led to him leaving this world. Mm -hmm. And that gave me actually even more, I would say, strength. It was a, it was a bigger sign for me because it was almost like my dad was saying, pretty, just keep going and go even harder because my dad was an entrepreneur. They had bought their own orchard years ago, but uh, my dad also struggled. My dad struggled in the fact that he was dealing with challenges when it came to alcoholism and other things in life. At times, he didn't feel like he was enough, but he was the best man I ever knew. He taught me how to be a man. He was very masculine. Just when he walked into the room, I just remember he's a very big statured man. He was actually in the police force as well for seven years in India. And so he knew how, he, how to carry himself. So when he walked into the room, he had total presence. Like people, you could feel his energy and you knew he was in, but he was the most kind person, very loving. But he was also, you know, when he meant business, he meant business. So that balance in him was just incredible. But also the challenges he went through that just kind of gave me the precedence to say, basically, go out there because there's a lot more guys out there that need this help. And that's where I am today is really... I didn't expect it to take off as big as it would, or it did, but that's how it's ended up. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. I actually really uh, so applaud you and support you because I think what you just said is really a truism. There's so many things going on in our world today. Men have lost their identity has shifted in so many ways and they don't know how to handle it. And uh, you're doing a great job with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's really much needed. One of my thoughts were, I, I have a, another friend whose family, her dad and mom came to India. She's in New York and her name is Dr. Uh, Bindu Babu. And she is really one of my closest friends in the world. I love her dearly. Education is so important to the parents in India and their expectation 
of their children to achieve that is Dr. Bindu has got, she's a medical doctor. She has, a, I think, two PhDs. She's got master's degrees. I mean, she has got incredible education, but yet she still has this down to earth kind of thing. And I, I just really love her. And, but I've noticed about the Indian culture and Bindu told me that it's actually regional in India. There's a portion of India where the parents really push the children to become either doctors, lawyers, or engineers, or, or something like that. Did, how did that affect you? Well, I, I would say on two sides. One is, I was always a black sheep. So uh, to give you a little bit of background, and I don't know what uh, part of India your, your friend is from, but so the area that I'm from, so I'm, my background, religious, although I'm not a practicing Sikh, I'm still from a background perspective, I'm Sikh. And the word Sikh means to learn. Mm-hmm. And my gra- grandfather was actually a very avid practitioner in terms of the religion. And he taught me from the very beginning, he said, the best thing that you could ever do is really learn because, you know, you can, you can learn as much as you want in life. But if you're not aware of things, if you're not aware of how the world works, how people work, you're just going to kind of continue to live in your own little world. So that's kind of where I got it from. My parents wanted it from a, hey, look, you don't want to be suffering like we do. But I was really challenged. It took me a while to even tell my parents that I had switched out of sciences into the business side. I was afraid. I didn't tell them, I don't think, for two years. You know, they thought I was going to be a doctor. And at some point in time, I told them and they, they were actually devastated because they said, what are you doing? Like, you know, you were, I was great at academics and had I followed that path, I, I would have become a doctor, but it just wasn't for me. So that pressure, I think it impacts people just in general, to, even today, even in children. I think I'm very careful having experienced that myself in terms of how I raise my children because I don't want to put my expectations on. I want to push them as hard as I can, but I don't want to put my expectations on them in terms of what I believe they should do because the biggest thing, I'm a very passionate person. And that's for me is the most important thing in life is passion. You know, if their passion is to clean houses, for example, and we have a couple that comes and helps clean our place, and they're passionate about what they do, mm-hmm. and they love it, and they take pride in it. So if that's your passion, continue that passion. My dad's passion was to grow apples and cherries. That was his biggest passion. He was so proud of it. So whatever your passion is, I'm a firm believer you need to follow that. So that's, that's how I tried to raise my children. But going back to your question, it was difficult because it was a path of, do I follow my passion? Or do I just make people happy, which I think majority of people today do is just make other people happy. Yeah, I think that one of the things that you probably did, I write a lot about expectations and I research them because I believe that our expectations is a gift from God and that it's implanted in us at birth or conception or however, whatever you believe in. And I think that we look at our expectations through two lenses, either faith or fear. Mm. Fear stops everything. Faith puts it through. And faith isn't always a religious thing. It could be faith in some a coach or any number of ways. But really, the most important thing is having faith in yourself. And one of the things you brought up that I really resonated with, at nine years old, I was abandoned and had to figure out life on my own. And not abandoned in the traditional sense of brought to a the fire station steps. Uh, my parents just kind of their lives went separate ways and they didn't divorce, but they just, because of circumstances, and we could talk about that later. But anyway, their children became, we had to fend for ourselves and figure out, and we were left at the farm to do all the chores and all kinds of things. It's a, it's a long story. But one of the things that I learned that resonated with what you said is when I was nine years old, I had a conversation with God on a hilltop and heard a voice that just said, just be and do, and just be patient and and everything will come your way. And from that point on, I started looking at everything in life as a learning experience. And every event in my life, I'm I'm a Vietnam vet, went to to Vietnam as a Marine. And through that, through the loss of my wife in 2006 to ovarian cancer, all the major tragedies in my life, I've always looked at everything as a learning experience because you cannot have a failure when you learn something from it. So I never looked at any, my perspective was not looking at anything as something was happening to me. I never took that victimization. I took the knowledge that I was gaining from the event and taking it to propel my life. 
And it's really made a huge difference. And I think you did that too. When you came to, you had an epiphany <laughs> that you did not want to be an accountant or, or be in the financial field and you wanted to be happy and, and serve and you took action. And that's the other key of everything. People have all these thoughts and expectations and epiphanies all the time, but they don't do anything with them. And they just don't do anything. And it's fear that stops them. Yep. And, and if you're fearful, you're not going to get anything done. You're not going to live your true passion and your true identity. And, you know, I, what are your thoughts? Oh, I completely agree. I <laughs> just nailed it. Bang on. It's all those what ifs that really <laughs> hold us back in life. Yeah. And that is the worst thing that you can do. And that's why I think it's so important. That's, that's why I focus. I really, to the corporate world, it was very interesting. It was a very interesting experience for me because I was always a go-getter. I was known as a guy that to blow things up and put things back together and really make things better. I realized because I, I had gotten this reputation that I did things that other people weren't not able to do, but didn't want to do. They didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want to put in all the effort. They just didn't want to take a chance to do something different. I kind of did that throughout my entire life. And it just kind of made me wonder, like, why are people not able to do this? And that's, you know, I've studied psychology, neuroscience, and mindfulness for decades now. Mm -hmm. And it really came down to me. And, and, and I think that's why I've, I've come down to this path is a lot of people talk about, okay, you change your perspective, change your mindset, do this, but there's no real system behind it. And that's tough for people because you can read a book, and I've experienced this many times with uh, individuals, is they'll read a book, but they won't make change. They'll take one concept and they'll kind of work with it for a little bit, but then nothing, nothing comes out of it. So for me, it was really that key moment that it really hit me that I said, what is the difference between a person living A life and a person living B life, A entrepreneur, B entrepreneur, whatever the situation is? Because I could give the exact same information to two different people and they would take it in two different, completely different ways and execute differently. And that bridge for me really came together, which is a self-mastery component. If you can really master yourself, then you can master life. And, but we're so trained and we're so ingrained, especially in today's decade, that everything is about external. Mm -hmm. right? Especially if you want to grow your business, you got to have the latest marketing, you got to have the technology, you got to do all this. But people need to realize that all of that is secondary because the people that are running the show are the most important thing. There's someone behind the technology, right? There's someone behind the systems. And if they're not up to par, if they're not able to master themselves and make decisions effectively and take action, as you said, then you're not going to get the results, whether it's in business and in life. So that's a philosophy and that's kind of what I've been studying. And that's what I've put together from the programs that I have for individuals in terms of Okay, how do you really master yourself? Because I'm a firm believer. You know, philosophical means in terms of learning from the great leaders of, of past times through to the neuroscience and psychology that it really comes down to being able to lead yourself. And what I talk about is really aligning, and I'm sure you can relate, Art, is mm -hmm. the alignment of your energy, your life energy, your thoughts, and your emotions. And once that's in alignment, then that's what I call you're in a state of total power and creation. Mm -hmm. But most people are not in that state. Or if you're in that state, you feel it momentarily. And, and people have felt that, right? There's probably times in an individual's life, a person's life, where they felt like nothing could hold them back. You were on top of your game and you just felt alive. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. I've taught myself to live in the moment because I think when you live in the moment, 
you enjoy life much more and you, you're focused on that. And I'm very mindful of that. I yes. mean, and my expectations are the other part because I've become so in tune to them. Yeah. And it's really made a huge difference in my life. Everybody always used to ask me, because I owned my own business for 35 years before my wife died and, and all that. And uh, they always said, everything you touch turns to gold and you're always so happy. <laughs> 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 and, you know, I, I used to say, hey, you know, it's because I just live in the moment and I just take each moment at a time and just do. I, I don't stop doing it. My audience gets tired of me saying this, but I'm going to be 72 in, yeah, wow. in uh, August 26th. And uh, I'm going to do until the day I go, just like your dad, just yeah. like your dad out in the orchard. I'm going to be out in my orchard, you know, just doing <laughs> my orchard is the whole world. You know, I just love yeah. living. And, uh, and I think when people learn how to change their perspective in being mindful and really using it to the betterment of themselves. I couldn't agree more. People need to become more introspect. Matter of fact, Expectation Therapy is my book, and it's based on a formula out of physics, the formula of expectation that scientists use, and I convert it into a behavioral uh, model. And it's based on three things that are very, very simple and basic. Identify, clarify, and solidify with a written plan, and then carry it out. And, you know, I've had great success in coaching people and businesses and corporations doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's people need to start identifying what they want. I call it wants, needs, and desires yep. and start identifying them and working towards fulfilling them. It's really life changing. And I think you and I are proof of that. Yes. You know, there's just a, a freedom in it that is not the common man doesn't just get there. You know, they, they get too wrapped up in the external. They let their, the people that surround them, they try to live to their expectations instead of the expectations of themselves, your core expectations, I call them, because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. So even in the financial market, I mean, if you look at every corporation, they have forecasts, their <laughs> expectations of their forecast of what they're yeah. going to perform. I mean, expectations, we're bombarded with them every day. And that's part of the problem for man is that we have so many expectations every day from the most basic thing is breathing to the most complicated mathematical or complicated problems solving things we have. We have literally thousands of expectations every day. We just don't focus on them and become mindful of them. And that's what man has to do. Yes, I, so, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's amazing what it can do for somebody, but people are so resistant to it. <laughs> Yes. Don't you see that? <laughs> yeah, I see that quite a bit because people are just caught up in the go, go, go these days. And yeah. they don't have time to sit back and be mindful and think. They don't uh, want to think. Yeah, I have great admiration for, for some of the real young people that are going and not going to college first and traveling and doing all the things they want. I have a friend here in Austin that just moved from San Francisco and she's been to 66 countries wow. and around the world and literally by herself and she just runs her business and she makes enough money to go from place to place. And now she's kind of decided, I think she's 30, maybe 32, 33 years old. And she's decided to make Austin her home now. And she's felt like she's traveled all that she wants to, and she wants to settle down. And people like that, I just got to commend because that takes a lot of guts for a young lady, you yeah. know, to travel around the world. I mean, she's been everywhere. I mean, India, Bangladesh, I mean, Vietnam, wow. you know, the Orient, Europe, everywhere. So, you know, there's a lot of young people out there and I commend them for living their, what they're wanting right now out of life. So, but uh, how do you think, well, I, I want to know more about your neuroscience and some of your background within your psychology and stuff. Where did you go to school? Oh, so interesting. So I've, I've been to a number of different schools. I think from an academic standpoint, I've been to, so there's a, I don't even know how many institutions I've been to from an academic standpoint, probably five or six. My formal education is in finance, management, and innovation, mm -hmm. and also executive leadership. So I have a, I'm a certified executive leader. I'm a certified innovation executive. I'm 
I got my EMA in innovation. So I've, uh, from that standpoint, I, I have a lot of education, formal education mm-hmm. on the business and innovation side. And, and neuroscience and psychology has always been a passion of mine and mindfulness has been a passion of mine. So I, I really, I would say what I just basically did, and it, because I, I come from an operations background, I'm very systematic, I had to put together a system because I had to be clear in my mind to say, okay, all these practical thoughts are great. But like you said, you know, you take something from physics, you actually need to make it practical. Mm -hmm. And so I really took and said, okay, what are the most important characteristics or or factors or pillars to really get someone to master themselves so they can master their life? And I really nailed it down to 10 and it's components of neuroscience, of psychology and mindfulness, because there's, once you understand how the brain works and you understand how psychology works, the awareness component of just knowing that in itself is very powerful. Just knowing that your brain sends signals a certain way so you don't have to react. Or if even if you do react, you don't have to judge yourself. You can just say, oh, that was my brain doing that. And you forgive yourself and you move forward, right? And then you slowly Mm -hmm. are able to do exercises where you take control of your brain. And that's very important. I think Mm -hmm. today as people, we are just biggest or worst enemies because we judge ourselves first. We judge the way we look. We judge the way we act. If we say the wrong thing, we're judging ourselves. And so we just need to give ourselves a break. And sometimes we just need to say, okay, maybe that was just a response out of fear. As you mentioned, maybe it was a response out of just evolution. You're more open and you're more susceptible to actually feeling human rather than actually just feeling like you need to be perfect. Is this the the inner force formula that you're describing? Inner force formula is really taking to the three accounts. It's really the alignment of your energy, your mind, and, and sorry, your thoughts and your emotions. So there's nine components. One is what you talked about is Mm -hmm. being in the present moment. So the here and now is very important because you have zero energy in the future and you have zero energy in the past. You cannot hit a baseball tomorrow. You cannot hit a baseball today if I give you a bat and a ball. (laughs) You can only hit a baseball at this moment. When you realize the physics behind that, Mm -hmm. you will say, oh my God, that makes sense. And so that in itself is important because 80% of most people's day is thinking about the future of the past. And it takes, so think about it from this perspective. If you have 100 units of energy, because your brain consumes energy, it consumes about 20% of your calories, your daily calories. If 80% of those calories go towards something that you can't even do right now, you have 20% left to actually make an impact. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand. So the more you are here and now thinking about the present moment, the more impact you can have and the stronger results, the more basically power you have. So that is a big focus. The second one is really understanding the masculine and the feminine forces within each human being. And men have more of a, heterosexual men have more of a masculine, heterosexual women have more feminine. But in today's society, that's why I'm so passionate about this is because men are trained to really subdue their masculine energy and women are being trained to have more masculine energy and it's throwing off the balance. And so that polar opposite attraction that you have between the masculine and feminine energy is really dwindling these days in a lot of relationships right? Men are not able to live that masculine side. Women are expected to be more of the providers and actually step up more. And that's throwing off the balance. So, but it's important for an individual, whether you're a man or you're a woman, to understand that there's two types of energies and actually be aligned with whichever fits for you and whichever feels more comfortable for you. I'm just going to share an example. My wife comes from a split home and she was raised by her mother. Her father had remarried and has his own family, but her my mother-in-law had really trained my wife to be independent from the perspective of get an education, be successful, get a high paying job. You don't need to worry about having a man. Yes, you need to get married. Yes, you need to have children, but don't rely on your men. And that was one of the actually challenges that we had in our relationship. We have so much in common. Yeah. My, late, my late wife was raised the identical way. Don't rely on a man. Get yourself an education, get yourself a profession, make a great income, and then you don't have to worry and and lean on a man. (laughs) Yeah. So our relationship was completely out of balance because I had actually, even though I know this stuff, even though I coached on this stuff, I actually sat back and actually really calmed my masculine side down and actually didn't step up for the values that I believed in. The moment that a man or even a woman, you don't step up for your own values, that's when you're actually taking away from yourself. And so, I wasn't stepping into my masculine force, which and was enabling her to be more masculine. So long story short, at the minute I basically said, that's it, done, put my foot down, 
really brought myself back into the masculine force. It forced her to be more feminine. And I can tell you our relationship changed almost in a heartbeat. And she said to me, and she still says it, thank God, because she was tired of trying to play a role that she wasn't comfortable in because she was being raised and trained to be that way. But her internal essence as a woman was to be more feminine. <laughs> and so that, that really brought our relationship stronger. And we're, we haven't been, uh, you know, we have an amazing relationship right now. So that's a second component. There's nine of them. I could go through some more if you'd like. Uh, but you know, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know you might have some other questions. Yeah, I've got a, a question. What role does emotional intelligence play in it? Because I'm big into emotional intelligence yeah. because I think when people can identify their emotions and become mindful of them mm-hmm. and know what they mean, how they want to use them, I think it, it's a very powerful tool in there. The war chest. <laughs> yeah, it, it is probably the most powerful because again, mm-hmm. and you have those three buckets. You have, again, as I mentioned, the life energy, which is very important. That is the fundamental component. If you can't master that, it's hard to master your thoughts and it's hard to master your emotions. And so the second one is your thoughts, your mind, your brain. The third one is the emotional mastery. And every single thing that you do as a human being, I do as a human being, and you do out there as you're listening to this, is based on your emotions, is based on feelings. That's how your brain is designed. You cannot go around that because evolution, from an evolutionary standpoint, this is how your brain is designed. If you understand this, this will help you. It's designed to keep you safe, protect you from disease. It's designed to create status among others, affiliate with others, find a mate, keep a mate, and actually take care of your children so your offspring survive and carry on species. Those are the seven things your brain is designed to do. That's how you think. That's how your emotions are designed to operate. Mm -hmm. If you understand that, along with the other components of emotional mastery in terms of the different buckets of emotions, how to deal with your emotions, that is very critical because your emotional state is what determines your quality of life. Bottom line, if you want a better quality life, work on your emotions, work on quality emotions. So when I work with people, even entrepreneurs that are saying, hey, Pradeep, I need to grow my business by X amount. What I say to them is, okay, tell me what emotions you want to feel. And they're like, what the heck are you doing? Like, why would you ask me this question? You're supposed to be this, this guy that's, you know, this about business growth and self mastery. Like what? I basically, we may get them to work backwards because if they're going to increase their business by, let's just say double, whatever it is, whatever amount it is, is it going to create the emotions that they want? And if it's not, they're just going to put themselves in a bigger hole. So then we work backwards and we say, okay, what are the emotions? What kind of life do you have to have designed to really amplify those emotions? And then does your business, for example, actually support that or is it taking away from that? And so your emotions is the fundamental foundation for everything that you do, everything that you feel and your decisions that you make. Because I've been to Stanford and a lot of the research done at Stanford is really about decisions and action taking and Mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. And 95% of your decisions are based on emotions. That's been proven by research now. But your emotions also impact not only your decisions, but your actions. The more emotions and the stronger the emotions that you put in, the types of emotions that you put into your decisions impact your execution and actions. So people always, I come across this too, where I get very smart people that say, I'm very logical, I'm going to make this decision. And they make a very logical decision. Great. But they didn't put any emotion behind it. So what do they have? They just have a logical decision with no passion, no drive, and no commitment behind it. So are you going to execute as well? Probably no. not. So that's why people need to, you need to understand that emotions are fundamental. That's why passion, feeling love, feeling joy, this, and even inner peace are important emotions to feel in life because that's how you get further ahead. So long story short, emotional mastery, emotional intelligence is absolutely critical. Know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. 
So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. One of the questions I had about, I think somewhere I read in your background, you've worked with athletes and helping them. Is that true or is that? Well, when I was a personal trainer, yes, yeah, some yeah. of the individuals were athletes. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I, I work with some athletes and with expectations and how to use their expectations to increase their athletic performance. They're very easy to work with because they're, they already know how to manage their expectations more than most people, athletes yep. do. And uh, how do you use emotional intelligence and your system with athletes to get them to perform better? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question because I don't work with athletes very much anymore. I, I work with very high-performing entrepreneurs and, and even entrepreneurs that just want to change their life or make more money or even professionals. So from an athlete perspective, it's very interesting because it's almost the flip side because depending on the moment, there's basically different perspectives of how an athlete needs to perceive things. And so emotions, the number one reason why athletes do not perform is actually in the moment when they're actually playing the sport is because of emotions, is because they're letting their emotions override their actual natural training, their system. Mm -hmm. And so what I've worked with uh, athletes to really work through, and this is through performance psychology, is that you need to be focused on the goal. And you need to be externally focused, meaning that you need to put yourself and not think about your internal feelings, but think about what's out there, what you're going towards. Because when you do that, you're more likely to achieve your goals. But there are times. And so the reason why some athletes have a hiccup is because they go internal sometimes and they start thinking about their feelings a little bit too much. And that's sometimes when you get a little bit caught up in the moment. And if you're not 100% confident, you can throw yourself off from a performance level perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's outside of the actual, let's just say the act of per- performing that sport where emotions really come in, where you talk to them about mindfulness, right? Because when they're out, outside of performing, that's when they're the most nervous because they're always thinking about, okay, this game is coming up. I need to perform at this level or you know, I'm seen as this and I need to keep my status up. So that's when the internal focus really comes in. That's where you really take them back to those moments and you start th- telling them, you know, bring them back to the moments that they were performing successfully. You get them to feel those emotions. So emotions are very powerful for athletes, just from my perspective. And it's been shown that using their internal reflection outside of the actual sport is more important than actually focusing on emotions while they're actually playing, just from my experience. Yeah, I always get interested when you see the guys on the sidelines in football games and they're, you know, I mean, they're jumping up and down and they're just so tied up emotionally. And yep. I, I often wonder, they get thrown into the game, you know, and I know from, cause I used to play baseball at a semi-pro level. I was a catcher, so I controlled a lot of the action in the game and I was always involved in the game. But when I played, people thought I was weird because I was always so focused on the game. Mm-hmm. And it just, I mean, everything became oblivious around me. I mean, a bomb could have went off and I wouldn't know it. I mean, because I was so focused on the game, but that's my passion. I mean, that's how it manifested itself. I'm very intense, yep. but I'm also very, <laughs> I confuse people because I'm very emotional in the sense that I cry. I'm not afraid to cry. When I was in combat <laughs> and we would get into a firefight, I'd have tears running down my face and guys would look over and go, wow. You're crying, man. What are you crying? (laughs) You know, and they would think it was, I was crying because I was scared or anything, but it was actually, it's how I release my tension and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, even now when I get really, really tense and and something's really pressuring me or anything like that, if I cry, I just get more focused. It's just part of my, my focus. I don't know how I became that way, but sometimes I think it's weird. So I guess. <laughs> no, that's great. That's, you know, that's important because you need to have that both sides, that balance side. Yeah. I think that's a misconception too for men is that they're not able to allow themselves to show their emotions. Uh, uh, I, I go to a movie 
And people go, what the heck is that guy sobbing about? You know, I don't have any shame. I, I just do it. And if people like it or don't like it, that's, they've got to work on their stuff because for me it works. And, and I would rather be that involved in things and feel what other people feel. You know, animals get hurt and it bothers me. And yeah. I feel a lot of that stuff. Everybody always asks me, am I an empath? And I always say, no, I'm not an empath. I'm just, I just feel things that, like that. You know what I mean? So well, we, we have a similar background. It's very interesting. Maybe it's growing up on in the outdoors. I, I have the exact same way. I have affinity for animals. I grew up like whenever there was an injured animal, if somehow people would bring it to my house. And I think that's, that's an important side. And I think it's art for you. It seems like obviously the profession that you're in, in terms of working with individuals, I think that's why it's so important and very unique for men to have that skill. Because in order to really get through, and this is my personal experience, to get the biggest results that I get, especially with men, is I have to be able to feel I have to be able to get inside them and I have to get them to feel what I'm feeling. Because if they know that I, I'm there for them, I, they can trust me, that I honestly have their best interests at heart and all I want to do is help them live a better life, they're more likely to actually open up, take the stuff that I'm actually showing them and teaching them and actually implement it. But if, if you have that, that rock solid, hard outlook which is the old school performance coaching, right? Mm -hmm. For athletes, it's not as effective. It's effective in some places, in some cultures, but it's not effective today, I don't think, especially in North America. I relate to people on an emotional level and that's why people relate back to me. I can literally go to New York and be on a subway or an airplane and have a conversation that is so deep and personal. And my wife (laughs) says to me sometimes, Golly, how'd you, how'd you get that person to tell you that all about <laughs> their life and stuff? And, you know, cause she's in, in, in the medical field. If you're wondering, I just remarried uh, 10 years ago or eight years oh, wow. ago after I lost my wife. So, and I've married another nurse. She's a nurse and anesthetist, but best thing I ever did because she's just a wonderful woman and supports me. But, but she always oh. wonders, you know, she said, we'll go to some event where she's with all the doctors that she works with and everything, you know, and all of a sudden they're all telling me their stories and <laughs> what's going on in their relationships. But that's a gift that God has just given me, you know, that's and, amazing. and I really cherish it and use it for the betterment of mankind. So that's my blessing. That's great. And that's much yeah. needed. It's funny you mentioned that because my wife's a nurse practitioner. Oh, well. really? So, yeah, it's, it's funny. We have a lot more similarities than we think. <laughs> yeah, my, mine's a nurse anesthetist. Yeah. Does anesthesia. So, yeah. Well, we're getting close to our sign off time, but I wanted to give uh, you the opportunity to uh, close it out and tell everybody where they can get a hold of you and, and what we can do and to support you in any way that we can. And, and uh, it's really been a pleasure. So, yeah, thank you for having me. I can tell I, you seem like a very genuine person. I can just feel your energy from that perspective. Well, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for having me on the show. Uh, in terms of getting a hold of me, you can always go to the website, which is themaleentrepreneur.com. I also have the Male Entrepreneur podcast, which we talk about just guy stuff, really. And I'm also excited because I'm launching a program here for the masses in about three or four weeks, where I'm really going to take that inner force formula and actually it's an online program for individuals to really be able to self create that self mastery within themselves and master their life and business. So I'm excited about that as well. Boy, that's, that's going to be great. I got to keep up with that, but we'll have you back because we, uh, I love get, uh, connected with people that are like mine and we really do have so many similarities. Yeah, yeah that's but, great. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Everybody out there, you now have all the information that you've, we, you have been given is going to be in the show notes. And uh, we thank you, Pradeep. And uh, Heather White, you can take us away. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.